Now, uh, Diana, in the um, spring issue of the Claremont Review, uh, you published um, a marvelous review of uh, two books about, well, one book about and one book by, Malcolm X. And in the course of this very wide-ranging and interesting uh, essay, you discussed a, a whole series of, of uh, black um, uh, figures in American mm -hmm. literature, going all the way back to Frederick Douglass, and including Booker T. Washington and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and um, Malcolm X himself, and of course Martin Luther King. Uh, mm -hmm. Why those five? What's, tell us a little bit about them and, and why you're interested in them. Uh, yeah, well, one thing I would just say, those are the big five. The big five, okay. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, there are, the lots, obvious five. Yeah, there yeah. are lots of other figures in African-American political thought who are you know, worthy of, of notice, but you, you do first have to pay attention to those big five. Um, and I guess I always find myself most drawn to those figures who have the most heroic backgrounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so Frederick Douglass, you know, first and foremost Now, how many uh, were among them. slaves? Uh, Frederick Douglass was a slave uh, into his adulthood. He actually became uh, a runaway slave uh, and had to purchase his freedom in a few, a few years after, later, after his yeah. escape yeah. from slavery. Yeah. Uh, the other one who was born into slavery was Booker T. Washington. He was actually freed as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, at about age nine. Uh, but in, in another way, uh, someone like Malcolm X uh, has his own experience with certain modern-day forms of enslavement, mm -hmm. uh, his involvement with drugs and sexual license, and he came to understand that, really, as a form of, a form of slavery. Uh, you know, Douglas and Malcolm X were both almost entirely self-educated. Uh, Douglas... Yes teaching himself to read, you know, as a young boy when he hears his master say, uh, if a slave learns to read, it will forever unfit him to be a slave. Mm -hmm. And Douglas said from that moment he <laughs> understood the direct pathway from slavery to freedom. Now, um, uh, uh, describe that famous moment when uh, Frederick Douglass turned on his... Um, Owner was it, or who someone was yeah, about to whip him? Th that's the other really formative experience for Douglas. I think there are these two experiences. First, his self-education, mm -hmm. which frees him from ignorance, uh, and then this moment when he uh, is 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 uh, subject to the lash. He spends six months with this slave breaker. Uh, he's been turned over to the slave breaker because, in fact, learning to read did make him <laughs> rebellious. <Yes. laughs> did make him unfit, As predicted. unfit yeah. to be a slave. Uh, and a particularly horrendous beating really recalls him to himself, and he determines to resist. Uh, and he engages in a two-hour hand-to-hand battle with Covey, uh, Edward Covey, the slave breaker. Uh, and he says that from that moment, How did the battle and, and, and come Kobe out? is, is on, uh, uh, Douglas uh, fought defensively. In other words, he was just determined to resist. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's this, you know, throwing him to the ground, uh, that kind of thing, but never actually throwing a punch. Yeah. Uh, and after two hours, Covey gives up. Hmm. And Douglas said from that fo moment forward, Covey never tried to whip him again. And Douglas says, from that moment, I was a free man in fact, mm -hmm. though I still remained a slave in form. So a free man in fact, and what made him a free man in fact is that he had freed his heart mm -hmm. of fear of death. Mm -hmm. In other words, he was, he was willing to, to hazard himself. Right. He was willing to hazard all for liberty. Yes. So, so, I mean, one of the lessons that I take from Douglas is that freedom really is something internal. Mm -hmm. It's about... Conquering your ignorance yes. and conquering your fear of death. It's not something external. And that this is something that really emerges from the black experience. I mean, you might make the mistake of thinking, oh, yeah, freedom just means... Just know, another word for nothing just, left to just lose. Something, yeah, yeah, something <laughs> physical, right? Yeah. You know, uh, but I think all of the great black thinkers really come to understand this internal element in freedom. Uh, and that, and that uh, yes. Malcolm X is, is one of those who comes but to that, understand uh, that. But that internal element wants to externalize itself. Yes, of course. So they're, not not, content, sure. they're not content to be like Solzhenitsyn and the gulag 
free inside, even though they're it, completely free within the prison outside. walls. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's right. So Douglas says, from this moment forward, I was a free man. In fact, but he was determined to translate that into the form of freedom also. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for, I think that moment guaranteed, in a way, his escape from slavery, or that he would make an escape from yes. slavery, whether well, so, successful And he's the figure to, through whom you came to this whole subject, really. And he is yeah. a, a fascinating figure. His autobiography, um, as you say, many of these men write autobiographies, yeah. um, is uh, fascinating. And uh, he, he was, of course, both a political figure of note once he was free, as well as a literary figure. Say something maybe about his yeah. his politics. His, his later yeah, just development. A... Uh, yeah, and this actually might get us to the question of uh, how does Douglas stand towards the, the founding. Mm. Uh, in a way, this question is most complicated or tortured for him because he lives at a time when slavery still exists. Uh, he lives at a time when the Fugitive Slave Law is in effect. Right. Uh, he lives before the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, and so this question of the Constitution and whether it is a pro-slavery or an anti-slavery document is really crucial for him. And he really begins, uh, well, he becomes involved with the Garrisonian abolitionists. Yes. Right? Uh, and, but he becomes a—I mean—he becomes a columnist. I mean, he, a, a writer. A, a, of, a writer, um, yeah. After note. becoming a, a speaker, he first goes on the mm -hmm. anti-slavery lecture circuit right. a, as a as a Garrisonian, and the Garrisonian view of the Constitution is that it was, you know, a, a pact with the devil. That there had been this bargain made that was so tainted, uh, so corrupt that you really had to deny the Constitution. Mm -hmm. They called for the annulment of the Constitution. Right. They argued that it was illegitimate to hold office under the Constitution, illegitimate even to cast a vote mm -hmm. under the Constitution, even if that vote would have been the vote that brought an end to slavery. <laughs> yes. Right? I mean, yeah. that's how morally pure the Garrisonians sought to be. So, so Douglas begins as a Garrisonian, but then he starts to rethink that. Uh, for one thing, just pragmatically, mm -hmm. if what you're really interested in is freedom for the slaves, uh, why set for yourself this task of bringing down the government <laughs> as, yes. the, as the first step or yes. the essential step to, uh, to, the, to the abolition of no, slavery? He sort of undergoes a uh, political education after his own you know, literary self-education. And it's, a, it's very yeah. interesting to do that in public, basically. It, which, I mean, yeah. all these stages were Do known to the world. I mean, they were, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. His, by this point, he has his magazine, The North Star. Uh, he's coming into contact with the Liberty Party men who were more sort of political action abolitionists. Yeah. Uh, and they subscribe to an anti-slavery mm. reading of the Constitution. And Douglas actually spends a two-year period where he really thinks about constitutional interpretation. He'd like to move in this new direction, but he doesn't really know yet whether it can be rightful. Right. You know, whether, whether, whether this is really true to uh, constitutional interpretation, to read the Constitution as a more anti-slavery document. Uh, and he eventually uh, changes his mind. He announces that in the North Star, saying that he now understands uh, the Constitution to be a glorious liberty document. That's right. Uh, and he Wonderful says, phrase. We, yeah, yeah and, and that we will now use the Constitution uh, as a weapon, really, in the cause of emancipation. And, and now coming after him, uh, uh, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, do they see themselves as in his shadow in any way or uh, influence? Do they play off of him in a certain way? Certainly uh, Booker T. Uh, as a young man, uh, as a young boy, he hears these arguments about black inferiority uh, and he says, my constant recourse was to Frederick Douglass. Mm. <laughs> Frederick Douglass could do this. I, I could do this also. Right. This refutes. Uh, all of the and, all of the slanders. And Booker T. Washington, I guess, is famous for, um, you know, founding uh, the uh, Tuskegee Institute and and the doctrine of self help. And you you know have to learn how to make a living and economically move forward. Uh, uh, freed slaves do, blacks yeah. do. Um, but he was not an enemy of literary culture or learning, was he? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, although his, um, I mean, his, his, 
I'll answer that one in a minute, but just, maybe just on, the, on this yeah. question of his relation to the, to the founding. I think he says less about that because in a way he's less political. As you say, mm -hmm. he's really directing the attention of African Americans to what he thinks is the, is the first task, the, mm -hmm. the, the primary task, which is a, uh, educational uplift, uh, economic uplift. Right. Uh, and so, in fact, he is somewhat critical. The only issue, I think, in which he's critical of Douglas is on the 15th Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, and he actually argues that that was probably premature and perhaps unhelpful. The vote. Uh, yes. The suffrage, uh, yeah. Unhelpful in raising the question of black political power before whites mm -hmm. are in a position to be able to deal with that, to, what, to accept that. Uh, and before blacks themselves are in a position to exercise political power well yes. uh, and, and really in their own interests. Yeah. So, so he doesn't actually, Booker T doesn't say much about the Constitution, but he does talk always about Lincoln. Uh, and he offers Lincoln as really a model of the kinds mm -hmm. of virtues that are required by all Americans, uh, and particularly the virtue of patience, so this sort of gradualism that you get in, in Booker T. Washington, uh, and the virtue of moral courage. Right. And how does yeah. uh, um, Martin Luther King, of course, also famously saw himself in the image of Lincoln, uh, or at least you know, uh, felt uh, Lincoln was very important to his political mission and his maybe... Yeah in part to his self-definition. Uh, what is it um, about King that uh, fascinates you? Well, in a way, I, I find him the least fascinating. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> of, of all of these figures. Uh, and it may have something to do with the fact that, uh, and this is true of Du Bois also, both King and Du Bois are born into a more uh, privileged situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're both sort of members of the uh, the black elite, uh, the black bourgeoisie. Uh, they're both highly educated. You know, Du Bois mm -hmm. educated at Harvard. Harvard. He's in fact the first African American to receive a, a PhD from from Harvard. And at Berlin. Uh, and and Berlin, right? Exposed <laughs> to Hegel, of yes, yes, which you could see in his thought. So, um, and I'm. I guess less satisfied with the trajectory in the thought mm -hmm. of these more elite black thinkers. Uh, you mean they, they end up where they began, more or less? Uh, no, they, uh, they end up in a much worse place. Ah. Yeah, uh, Du Bois uh, clearly moves toward revolutionary socialism. I mean, he eventually abandons America. He immigrates to Ghana and becomes mm. a, uh, a, a, basically a spokesman for, for Stalin and Mao. Uh, and it seems to me that is a terribly sad end mm. for someone whose early writings are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, du Bois writes beautifully about liberal education. Uh, or, or you know, among among many topics, uh, and in and a, King's in a, King in a disappoints less, too. In a less pronounced fashion, I think King, at the end of his life, is also moving leftward uh, in a more anti-capitalist direction, and I, I think you don't see this trajectory at all in those uh, African American leaders who were more self-educated. Mm -hmm. So in in Douglas, in Booker T. Washington. And I, I entertain some hopes that Malcolm, Malcolm X. X, you know, his trajectory is is cut short. I mean, as as King's is also. Right. So we don't we don't quite know. But uh, but uh, none, nonetheless, on the question of King and the founding, uh, you're right. I mean, he does cite cite the founders favorably. He cites the Constitution favorably. I mean, in a way, you could say that his great "I Have a Dream" speech is a kind of condensed version mm -hmm. of where where Frederick Douglass ends up right. Right, when he speaks of this yes, promissory that's, note. That's well said. Right, that's, that's, well said. that's been issued to all Americans.